So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, present our efforts to, as a small uh, lab specialized in uh, phylogen mammalian phylogenetics, diving into the world of genomics and especially from rod kill. So, but first, let me give you a bit of uh, uh, information on the project we are sequencing genomes for. So this is called the uh, uh, Convergent uh, Project, and it proposes an integrative approach to convergent evolution in anteating mammals. Uh, convergent evolution is the process by which similar phenotypes arise independently in phylogenetically distant lineages, and you might know uh, some of these examples. So uh, a famous example is the, the classical example of uh, marsupial mammals and placental mammals in which highly similar morphotypes have evolved to fill the same environmental uh, niches. So such spectacular examples show that morphological uh, evolution in mammals uh, can be highly constrained by natural selection, and by looking at these kind of uh, examples, we can uh, have insight into the predictability of uh, evolution. Uh, and placental mammals are a specific case of uh, um, convergent evolution since the molecular revolution completely changed the phylogeny, as you can uh, see uh, by comparing these two, three, based on morphology and molecules. And basically what molecular phylogeny in this case have shown that is how little we know and we understand about the uh, morphological evolution and the link between the genotype and phenotype. So it has revealed a lot of uh, convergent evolution examples, and one particular example I'm interested in are anteating placentals. And I think it's a very good uh, model to study uh, evolutionary co convergence because there have been at least five independent origins in a well-defined phylogenetic uh, context now in both very ancient uh, lineages, such as the aardvark, uh, the South uh, American anteaters or pangolins, which have been eating ants and termites for more than, probably more than 40 uh, million years now, and independently. But also some uh, more recent instances of this, uh, this uh, diet shift, such as the hard wolf, which is actually a hyena that eats only termites. Nobody knows about that, but uh, that's a very interesting one. Oh, sorry. Um, so, also, myrmecopagy is a very uh, extreme diet, and it has led to a lot of uh, a large set of convergent uh, morphological adaptation in these animals. And also in mammals, we have a wealth of uh, comparative genomic uh, data with more than 300 uh, genomes available. And finally, some promising re uh, preliminary results have also been obtained on the potential role of the microbiome in this particular adaptation to this extreme diet. So what is the, the convergent project uh, about? It's really trying to uh, understand the complex uh, uh, interrelationship between the morphology, the genome, and the microbiome in that particular case of uh, adaptation, diet, diet adaptation. So, uh, of course, I will be focusing on the genomic part uh, today, and that's why we uh, dive into the world of uh, mini-ion sequencing. And so the plan is to sequence five uh, reference genomes for the different uh, lineages. And what we want to do with those genomes is try to understand if the same genomic adaptation underlies the different uh, convergent uh, phenotypes we've seen in these independent lineages, or are there completely different genes that are, uh, in fact, behind those adaptations? So we, we look at uh, gene loss and relaxed selection, for example, on two genes that uh, in, in lineages such as uh, pangolins and anteaters that have become completely toothless, but completely independently. And uh, another thing we did already uh, with some partial genomic uh, uh, data is the look at the evolution of gene family. And in particular, we, sh we have shown that uh, uh, pangolins and anteaters have different repertoires of uh, chitinous genes that might be useful to uh, digest uh, uh, ants and termites. And finally, what we want to do is really to uh, conduct some genome-wide analysis of adaptive convergent uh, molecular evolution, so trying to search for the footprints of uh, um, mo uh, con convergent molecular evolution in genome-wide uh, alignment of those uh, animals. So that's why we really need uh, good quality uh, genomes, but the constraint is uh, lots of those uh, species are uh, rare, elusive, and also sometimes protected, such as pangolins, for example. So it's really hard to get uh, really high quality samples for those animals. And that's why we turn to rod kill. 
because at least some of them uh, are frequently found uh, as roadkill uh, along in South America, in French Guiana, particularly for us, and, and also in South Africa. And I will be focusing on South Africa, as you can see here. So in South Africa, or Southern Africa in general, as you can see here, there are uh, thousands of fatal encounters between cars and uh, animal wildlife. Uh, and it's uh, somehow uh, an underexploited resource in, in genomics. But uh, actually many projects uh, are using rod kills to, as a census for uh, living spaces and also, of course, trying to reduce this phenomenon, trying to find some uh, solution to reduce this. And, and it's really impressive in, when if you drive in, so in South Africa, you can find a lot of, uh, actually a lot of uh, rod kills. So there are, there are a lot of citizen science uh, projects, for example, that try to uh, look at that. And one particular project uh, conducted in, in South uh, Africa has shown that uh, actually two of the most uh, frequently encountered rod kill in, in uh, South Africa are two Mamecophagus carnivoran species, the bat ear fox on the left, uh, which is a uh, uh, fox that eats a lot of termites. Uh, more than 70% of the diet consists of termites and hens. And uh, the art wolf, I already talked about this famous hyena that it only a specific uh, one or two specific uh, species of termites. And that's something we verified when we were conducting actual field work in reserve, just commuting between the different reserves, uh, we found two specimens of, uh, rod kill specimen of these two uh, species that look fresh enough to take samples from. So we collected samples with my colleague <coughs> from the National Museum in uh, Bluefontein. And back in the lab, uh, we tried to do some genomics. And uh, in fact, the problem is that, of course, these samples are degraded, and they don't have uh, really high quality uh, DNA, so much of the sequencing centers or sequencing platforms won't really want to uh, um, use this for trying to get some long reads. So we decided to order our my own starting kit and give it a try. So it's mainly the work of uh, Marika uh, Tilak, which is uh, our uh, who is our lab engineer, and Remy Alio, uh, my PhD student. And we, so we try that, and uh, starting from different tissues, ear biopsy, muscle, salivary gland, al also uh, some different uh, uh, preservation procedure with 95% ethanol or RNA later. And after trying some commercial kits, as everybody has done probably, uh, to extract uh, uh, good quality DNA, we came back to the good old uh, phenol chloroform DNA extraction. And we used site selection uh, on a G column just in, in an attempt to really have more uh, yield uh, and not really really long reads. And we started with the LSK uh, one 108 and then uh, 109. And after a few months, I would say, uh, we were able to get this nice looking uh, green uh, run and a pretty decent uh, redistribution. So there are, of course, some challenges w uh, working uh, with rod kills. In genomics, and of course, the main problem is that post-mortem DNA uh, degradation, and you, as you don't uh, uh, control for um, the time uh, after death, where you found the specimen, and so it's very variable, and sometimes uh, you get really good quality uh, DNA that might be comparable at actually to uh, very fresh samples, and sometimes it's very degraded because all these enzymatic uh, uh, reactions just starting after death and trying to get your uh, long reads. Uh, some technical tips uh, uh, from road genomics, uh, just from practical uh, uh, experience. We found that the uh, preservation method has, a, in fact, a big impact. And surprisingly, the RNA, uh, pr tissue preserved in RNA later yield very uh, uh, much more uh, good quality DNA than the ones preserved in ethanol. Uh, which is a bit of a pain because uh, most of the samples we have, for example, in our collection are stored in 95% ethanol. So, but that's the experience we had. Uh, also, it was a good idea to try to clean off uh, epidermal cells and the, uh, the in order to remove necrotic cells 
because uh, that's where really the, all these enzymatic interactions uh, are happening and uh, shearing the, the DNA. So before and after cleaning makes a big, big uh, of a difference in this case. And uh, finally, of course, as many of you know, the pur DNA purification step is uh, one of the most uh, crucial steps to get some nice poor occupancy with the mean ion. And we played a lot with the, uh, adjusting the ratio of impure beads at the purification step. And we found that a 0.4x uh, uh, ratio was the best uh, for us. So Marika is uh, planning on uh, writing a, a small protocol here, recapitulating all these uh, kind of uh, um, advices to get, to get uh, samples from old kings. And so what we got? Uh, so we did 15 flow cells for the Batia frogs, a total of 30, uh, 33 uh, gigabytes in 10 million reads of mean length about 3 kb. It's not that bad. It was even better for the, the hard wolf, but because we reach about the same amount uh, of data, but only with about half the reads, which are uh, much longer, so it's like 5 kb. And just to give you, uh, an, uh, even so we, we uh, did some size selection, we still get some long reads, so we, we are not part of the very, of the long read club yet, but uh, our uh, maximum length was about 200 uh, KB reads, and we still have uh, 143 uh, ultra long reads, or more than 100 KB, so it's pretty decent uh, things from a road kill uh, sample. So how does it translate now into uh, assembly? So of course, uh, given this uh, um, constraint, and uh, we, we don't really, uh, it would be really cost prohibitive to get Mean ion, we tried to get mean ion only uh, genome assembly. So we decided to use hybrid assembly mixing Illumina reads with uh, the long grids. So it's just uh, uh, for the sake of, of comparison, we, we, we just uh, compare in this slide uh, the assemblies using sub de novo on Illumina reads only versus a Mazurka assembly mixing Illumina reads with mean ion reads. And as you can see, we get, uh, uh, of course, a really big improvement uh, in the number of contigs. So we are down to about 10,000 or even less for the hard wolf, 10,000 contigs, which is pretty good for uh, genomic assembly, and uh, N50 of uh, about 700 KB. So if we perform some more detailed comparison with uh, what's available as a mammalian genomic assemblies. In terms of number of contigs, as you can see for the different groups here, uh, in carnivores, uh, we have among the best uh, uh, number of uh, contigs, smallest number of contigs. Only the dogs and cat genomes uh, have be better contigs. And that's the same in terms of N50 with uh, 700 KB. We are among the best uh, assemblies currently available. And if you look across all the, the different mammals, actually we're doing really, really good. There are only a few uh, other uh, as current assemblies that are doing better than that. So by using Rodkill and this really uh, um, simple approach, we managed to get some pretty decent uh, good assemblies, at least for these carni carnivoran genomes. Well, so now in terms of completeness, so we look at the Busco uh, mammalian uh, genes, and, you, and you, as you can see, we have uh, more than uh, 92, or about 92% in the both cases uh, of complete boost codes that can be found in those assemblies, meaning that they are really uh, pretty complete. But of course, the in so uh, just uh, to compare with the available other carnivore assemblies, and uh, you see that uh, we are in the top 20 of this uh, uh, boost code score with 90%. And uh, Yes, but the ultimate goal is not to work on the Busco uh, genes, but to work at the genome scale. So we try to do the same uh, as the Busco, but with our uh, currently uh, uh, our current Automam database, that is uh, uh, curated database of 4,500 uh, orthologs, single copy orthologs that we have for uh, more than 100 uh, mammalian species. So we try to add. Uh, to search for those genes uh, in the genomes using a gene blast approach. And uh, we 
as you see, we managed to find almost 90% of those genes in uh, our assemblies, which is really good. So now with all this uh, data, we, what we can do is just is to conduct finally uh, s those genome uh, size search for molecular evolution. So I just reconstructed a tree, for example, for 5,000 uh, genes for which we have all uh, these, uh, these uh, carnivores available. And uh, we can then we can start to look at uh, these which genes underlie the, the adaptation, the independent adaptation of these two lineages within the carnivora. And uh, another thing we could do uh, is, as you can see here, there is an uh, interesting thing with these species. They have both similar and disjunct distribution, uh, and some uh, actually some subspecies have, have been uh, defined for both uh, species based on morphological ground. And uh, we can try to test that uh, if there are some uh, genomic differentiation between the, the, the species, the different subspecies. And uh, just as a preliminary uh, data, we did some uh, genome-wide heterozygosity uh, estimation among the subspecies. And as you can see, there are differences uh, suggesting that uh, they have been se separating, or at least evolving separately for some time to enough to accumulate some difference uh, in uh, genetic di diversity. Okay, so just uh, to conclude, I, s I hope I convince you that uh, roadkill could be used as a suitable source of DNA for Mainarian long grid sequencing. Uh, that uh, hybrid assembly with uh, immunarids uh, with mazurka provides carnivore genomes with high contiguity and completeness, at least compared to what was what is available at the moment, and that's a cost-effective strategy uh, that allow to obtain pretty decent quality uh, genomes. And it, of course, it paves the way to a genome-wide analysis of molecular convergence and large-scale population uh, genomic projects for specific limitation, even using uh, rod kills. And I just, uh, with that, I just uh, want to thank uh, the European Research uh, Council for funding the Convergent Project and the other uh, um, research agencies, and you for uh, your attention. Thank you.